بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولكم بودن جيرز اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. Today we start the second block of our 0625 physics IGCSE. Um, we talked about motion, forces, effect of forces, and today we will go to another branch of physics which is thermal physics. Okay? Now, to start with, I have to start with the kinetic particle model. This is a very important uh, theory in physics. It's not a theory, it is a, uh, it is a model. Uh, it is a model that is used to describe the motion and the movement and the effects for gases. Okay, but in any ways, uh, in IGCSE, we use it to explain things and unfortunately, we have only two or three equations only in the whole chapter. The whole chapter is about explaining and describing. So a lot of talking will uh, be in this chapter. Okay, to start with, you have to know the properties of the states of the, mat of the matter. Of course, you know this from before. Uh, you, you know this from chemistry and maybe from fourth grade. But in any ways, you have to know these things. Now, the differences between solid, liquid, and gas, and by the way, these are three states of matter, but in reality, we have five states of matter. In, additional, in addition to this, we have plasma state, we have Bose-Einstein condensation state. Forget about these, let's stick to these properties and the, the things that we know. Now, of course, we will concentrate on solid, liquid, and gas. Now, the mass of the solid, liquid, and gas is definite. Don't forget that the mass is the amount of material inside the object. This object may be a solid or liquid or gas, which means if we go deep, it represents the amount of atoms inside this object. So if this, is, if this object is gas or liquid or solid, if you don't add or remove anything from this object, the mass stays the same. Okay, but the volume thing is not the same for the three states. The, the, the solid state and the liquid state, it is definite volume, which means that if I have a mass with a volume, uh, a solid thing with a volume um, three centimeter cube, it will remain three centimeter cube, and that's it. If you did not touch it, if you did not add or remove anything from this, object, the volume is the same. Same idea for the liquid, okay? If I have a glass of water that contains 100 uh, centimeter cubic, cubic centimeter of liquid, nothing will change about, for this volume if you did not add or remove. But it's not the case for the gas. It is indefinite. Why is that? Because <clears throat> we will talk about this after a while. The gas particles will slip is spre spread over the whole space, which means the volume of the gas is the same of the volume of the container. Put the gas in a small container, the volume of the gas is the same small container volume. Uh, just open it in a, in a bigger volume, the gas will spread through the whole space and the new volume will be the volume of the new container. Okay, now, Compressibility. Of course, compressibility is very, very, very attached to the volume thing. If I compressed something, I will change its volume. And because of this, the solid and liquid, it's not possible for the solid, it is almost negligible uh, for the liquid. Uh, but in case of gas, of course, we can compress it. I think all of you know the lighter, the one that we can get fire from, the liquid inside it, it is a gas, and this gas is compressed to be liquid. Just remove the cap and you will see the whole liquid will spread as a gas through the whole room. Okay, now what about fluidity? Fluidity means that if you put it on the ground, it will flow, it will move by itself. Of course, the solid will not move, it's a solid thing. Okay, but the liquid and the gas, of course, it will flow, it will move from this place. Now, rigidity, highly rigid for the solid, less rigid for the liquid, and gas, it's not rigid at all, of course. 
diffusion, slow, fast, very fast. I will go through this very fast because we will talk about each one of them alone. The space between particles inside in the solid most closely packed the, the, the region inside the solid, the space inside the solid is very crowded because the particles are very close to each other, but less closely packed for the liquid, of course, least closely packed for the gas. And the last thing here, interparticle force, we have a definite uh, force for the particles in or between the particles in the solid, less force at, uh, for the liquid. Of course, we are talking about attraction force, the atoms inside any molecule and any object will attract each other to hold the shape of the object. If it is uh, solid, of course, we will have um, a fixed space, a fixed volume, a fixed mass, so the shape will be the same. But in case of the liquid, the attraction force is less than the solid, so you will have a fixed volume, but it's not a fixed shape. And of course, uh, as I said, the uh, shape of the solid will be definite al always, but for liquid and gas, it acquires the shape of the container, but in case of liquid, it will not take the whole volume of the container, as I said before, which means if I have a half glass of water, okay, the water will get the shape of cylinder, but it will not cover the whole volume. It's not the same for the gas. The gas will fill the whole volume, and so it will take the shape of the, vo of the container, but uh, also fill the whole volume. Okay. Now, the solids. I have to talk about each one of them in yeah, fast way because we have to move on. The particles are closed pack to each other. This is a very important thing, okay? Um, the particles are closed pack to each other, so the separation between the particles is small, which means that the attraction force is high. Guys, the thing is what? Always the attraction force, whatever the force is, electrical, magnetic, whatever, if you have two charges now or two magnets, if you put the two magnets very close to each other, the attraction force will be high. And so the separation between the particles, um, of course, affects the force between these particles. And of course, it is attraction force. Okay. Now, the thing is what, because the attraction force is very high, the solid can hold itself and the solid particles will vibrate in their places. The attraction force is high, so the particle is not free to move. But, of course, as always, and nothing is fixed in this universe, the particle will move because it has some energy. So what to do? It will keep vibrating in the same position. Okay? Now, um, as I said before, uh, the vibrating will be limited in limited area. And I put this picture because maybe the question will be, you know, draw the particles of a solid. You have to draw them in a regular shape, in a, a, a correct order, close to each other. Okay. Now, what about the liquid? Okay, in case of liquids, of course, the particles are not very close to each other. It's not crowded like the solid, but the particles are slightly over each other. They will slide over each other because the attraction force, it is high, but not at, as much as the solid. Okay, so there's a little bit of freedom to move. So the separation of the particles is higher, and so the attraction is less than solid, but still there is an attraction force. And because of this, the particles will not fly away. It will keep the same volume. And it is the liquid flow easily around uh, one another. They are kept from flying apart because of the attraction. Okay, now, what about the gas? 
the particles are moving randomly. Why is that? The separation is very high, which means the attraction force is almost nothing. It is zero, almost zero. Okay, and because the particles are free to move, there is no fixed shape, there is no fixed separation, there is no fixed anything, okay? But the, the, the mass is fixed. But in any ways, the particles, the attraction between the particles is almost nothing. And because of this, the gas is highly compressed. The particles are away from each other. By compression, the separation will be smaller and smaller. But in case of solid and liquid, the separation already is small. And so there's no space to compress. Okay, I think that you know all of these things from previous club, from previous grades. But in any ways, I have to talk about it. Okay, in any ways, now let's start the new thing. Okay, <clears throat> the kinetic particle model of matter is what? Simply, we have to consider all atoms, molecules, compounds, whatever the thing is that it uh, consists, uh, the, the, the object, okay, we will call them particles. Okay, and we will deal with them as particles and that's it. Okay, now because of this, I have to know how to describe the movement of these particles. And to do this, we have to talk about Brownian motion. Okay, what is Brownian motion? Now imagine that you are looking to a smoke, to smoke through the air in front of you. It's very obvious that the smoke will not be in a regular pattern, okay? The smoke will spread out through the whole space in the room. So it is easy to say that the, the, the motion of these particles, the smoke particles, the motion is random, okay? Now, keep in your mind that the particles are very, 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 very small. So if the smoke particles reached the corner of the room, this needs a very high speed, okay? Because it's very, very, very small. Okay, the thing is what? Now, the, micros the microscopic particles that are in a fluid move in a very fast, random, and zigzag motion. This is very important, guys. Now, microscopic particles means what? As I said, my, microscopic means small. So we talk about uh, atoms, molecules, compounds, okay? That are in the fluid. Fluid means so, uh, liquid and gas. So the smoke in the air is uh, microscopic particles in the fluid, which is air. Uh, we can insert dye in uh, fluids. Try to do this bring food coloring and put it, for example, in uh, water, uh, uh, one drop or two drops in a glass of water, and you can see this. The particles of the dye will spread randomly through the whole volume. If you want to see it in a faster motion, you can put it in not, um, uh, not water, not water, not use water, use maybe 7-Up, any soda, any transparent soda, drink, you can use the dye, uh, but just put two drops in the glass and you can see the, the, the spreading of these particles very clear. Okay, now um, what about the zigzag motion? The zigzag motion means what? Guys, the thing is simply we are adding, for example, smoke in air. Okay, now Okay, we don't see air, but there are particles there, air particles, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, monoxide, whatever, okay? Now, the movement of the particle will not be that simple, will not be very straightforward, and that's it. This smoke particle will collide with the medium's particle, the air particles in this case, but, just think about this for two or three seconds. Which one is bigger, the smoke particles or the air particles? 
Okay. Clearly, the bigger particle is the smoke particles. Simply, you see the smoke, but you don't see the air particles. So, how a very small air particle will affect the motion of a bigger, Afikra, much bigger uh, particle? The thing is, if you go back to the to momentum classes, the momentum, the collision effect of the force depends on two things, the mass and the speed. So even the, the air particle is very small, but the smoke particle is uh, huge. And so to compensate this, the, the air particles is very fast, which means it has a tangible momentum to change the direction of the small particle, which means if this is the smoke particle, okay, the air particles around it will hit it. And these are small, okay, but they are very fast. So this will change the direction of the smoke. And because it is surrounded by air particles and there are hittings from everywhere, the movement of this will be random. But what about zigzag? Simply zigzag because of the collision. And so the movement of the smoke particle is not straight. They don't have curves. The particle will go and the direction will be changed. So it will be in this way. You always have such uh, corners. Now, if the particle is here, it will go to this direction, maybe here, maybe there, maybe there. It is random, don't forget this, it is random, and this is the zigzag movement, okay? So the zigzag movement is due to the collisions between the particles and the light, very fast, mediums particle. So if this is smoke, Okay, and these are air particles, smoke particles, and the mediums particle are uh, particles are the air particles. But if, for example, if I have this particle, let's say that this is dye particle or maybe pollen. Okay, the pollen from flower. Put them uh, the particles in a glass of water, for example. You can see that the water molecules, the water particles will hit this pollen particle and this will change its direction. Again, we can see the pollen particles. You cannot see the water molecules, which means the pollen particles are bigger. But the very fast speed of these smaller uh, water particles can change the direction of the pollen. Now, in IGCSE, okay, um, the cases are limited for what? These particles may be smoke particles, may be pollens, sometimes it's dust, okay, sometimes. Now, the mediums particles, usually the smoke and dust particles sometimes um, inserted in air, and this is the medium will be, and for the pollen, it is in water. Because of this, I said fluid, okay? So the Brownian motion, the particles will move randomly, will move uh, fastly, and in zigzag movement. Okay, now we have an interna interactive question. Okay, please answer this question and we will continue this. Okay, after answering the question and I hope you answered it very well, let's use this theory for the gases. Okay, now the thing is what? In this theory for gases, the temperature of the gas is represented by the average kinetic energy or internal energy with the particles. Wait a minute. 
Now, if I want to study the gas, and you know that the gas, okay, has a fixed mass, but no fixed density, no fixed volume, no fixed shape. Because of this, I cannot study gas or gases in the same way that I study the solids. Simply, if I have a ball, I kick this ball so I can find the speed, the, the acceleration, the time, the distance, and whatever. But in case of gas, it's not the same idea. If I hit the gases, so how I can follow each one of them? We have, we have a very, very, very small particles and they are already in random movement. So we cannot do the same thing. Because of this, we have to study gases in order of three things. The temperature of the gas, the volume of the gas, and the pressure of the gas. Now, the temperature of the gas is represented. Represented means what? Means that if the temperature of the air is 30 Celsius, this doesn't mean that the kinetic energy of these particles is 30 joules. No, it's represented, which means what? Increasing the temperature of the gas particles will give kinetic energy to these particles and they will be faster. Okay, so the represented means that there is a relationship between the temperature and the kinetic energy, which is direct, of course. Increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy and the speed with the particles. Increasing or decreasing the temperature, of course, will do the, the opposite thing. Now, two things. The first one is internal energy. Guys, the meaning of internal energy is what? Okay, now internal energy, energy means it's the addition of kinetic energy and the potential energy with the particles of the gas. How is that? Of course, the gas particles are in movement, which means, of course, they have kinetic energy. Now, the, the particles, the atoms, contains nuclei, positive nuclei, and electrons, which are negative which means there always will be attraction and repulsion. Now, in, in terms of energy, you know that, and we talked about this before, this is potential energy, electrical potential energy. So the particles have mainly two energies, kinetic and potential energy. Now, internal energy means the addition of these two things. Now, in all level, don't concentrate on this, okay? If you, now, uh, after two years, uh, if you took A2 physics, you will talk about this ve in very details. And anyways, now, the, the, second, the first thing is the internal energy, which is the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Okay, now, what about this one? I said average kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. Okay, the thing is what? If I have a container, this, the, this container contains gas particles, okay? Now, in five seconds, tell me where will be the most energetic particles of these gas? Where in this container will be the uh, most energetic particles? Or, of course, um, and the mid and the lowest energetic particles, where are they? They are accumulated in which part of this container? Now, the thing is, we don't have one energy for all particles of the gas or anything, liquid or solid. We have a spectrum, a full spectrum of energies, which means we don't have one energy for all of them. Okay, and because of this, we talk about kinetic, average kinetic energy, the average for the whole particles. Okay, if you heat these particles, the average kinetic energy will be higher, which means the faster particles will be more faster, the slower particles will be faster too. Now, returning to this, 
there is no specific space and location for the most energetic particles. Simply, gas particles move randomly, which means they will not be in a specific place. They will go through all of the space. So there is no one space for each one of them, the mid, the lowest, and the most energetic uh, particles. And because of this, all of this, we talk about average kinetic energy. Okay. Now, another thing is what? Now, the temperature increased, the average kinetic energy increases too. Okay. We said this. Now, in SI units, you know that you have mainly five SI units. We talked about them. In case of temperature, the SI unit is the Kelvin. Okay? Now, in our syllabus, you have to know how to convert between the uh, Kelvin and Celsius. How to do this? It is exactly this idea. Okay? Now, Kelvin equals Celsius plus 273. Which means that if I have, uh, if I wanted to know the freezing point of water, which is zero Celsius, the Kelvin degree will be zero plus 273, which is 273 Kelvin or degrees Kelvin. Okay. Now, what about the boiling of water? K will be 100 plus 273, 373 degrees Kelvin. You have to know how to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. Okay, of course, in the opposite way too. Now, what about if I have a temperature of, uh, let's say, the Celsius temperature is negative, 100 Celsius. How much is the Kelvin? K will be, it's negative 100 plus 273. This gives 173 Kelvin. Okay, so even in minus, we have this. But, guys, the least temperature ever is what? Now, the Kelvin unit is used mainly in sciences because we have the initial temperature, the least temperature, which is zero. It's called absolute zero, zero Kelvin. The absolute temperature is zero Kelvin. Okay, this is the least temperature ever. Of course, we did not reach this yet. My info is that uh, there's something called Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland and France. It's a very huge donut shape accelerator, okay, uh, to accelerate the particles and antiparticles inside them, inside the, the, the accelerator. The thing is, to do this, to accelerate the particles, imagine that. It's 99.9999% of the speed of light. It's a very huge speed. And anyways, to reach this speed, one of the things that they have to do is to reduce the temperature to the minimum that they can. And my info is they reached, I think, two Kelvin maybe or one half, something like this. Okay, but we did not reach this zero Kelvin. In any ways, this zero Kelvin, if you apply it in the equation, zero equals C plus 273, this gives that the Celsius will be negative 273 Celsius. So the absolute zero is zero Kelvin is the least temperature ever, which is negative 273. Now at this temperature, the particles have the least kinetic energy. This is the least thing. There's nothing beyond this. Okay? Okay. Now, this is about temperature. Okay? The temperature represented by the average kinetic energy of the particles. Now, the volume of the gas is the volume of the container. We said this before. Now, what about part, uh, pressure? 
Now, the pressure of the gas is due to what? Of course, if you remember from the class of pressure, we said that the pressure is because of the force over area. But mainly, the forces that we were talking about, uh, the weight of the thing. If we have a solid thing, it's the weight of the thing. If we have a liquid, it's the weight of the liquid. But this is not the case in the pressure and the gases. The thing is, we have to talk about the collisions the collisions between the particles and the walls of the container. Why is that? Look, if this is the wall of the container, okay, and this gas particle that is going toward this um, wall, it will hit the wall and return back. Okay, so what? Now, the particle has a mass. The particle has an initial speed, I will just put any number from my mind, let's say that it's 3 meters per second, okay? But after bouncing back, even if the speed stays the same, okay? But I'm telling you that the momentum is changed. You know, the momentum is mass times velocity. Velocity, which means the direction is important. So when the direction of the movement of the particle changes, you have a change in momentum, okay? So, the collision between the particles and the walls of the container, okay, uh, which change the momentum, and that exerts a force on the walls. How is that? You know this from the momentum. It's the Newton's second law, because always, force equals change in momentum over time, which means that if you have a change in momentum, you have a force. And this force over the area of the wall, you have the pressure, because pressure equals force over area. So the thing is what? This is very important. There's nothing changed. The speed doesn't change of the same gas particle, I did not heat anything, okay? I'm, I'm talking like this because after a while we will change something to know what, what is the effect of this change on another thing, okay? The thing is what? Why there is a gas pressure? Because of the collision between the particles and the walls. Is there a collision between the particle and the other particle? Yes, it's a gas moving randomly. Of course, the particles will hit each other. But this is not the cause of the pressure. The pressure is on the container's wall. Okay, and so I am interested only in the collisions between the particles and the walls. Now, these collisions of the particles will change their momentum. And because the momentum changed, there is a force exerted on the wall. It's the same if we're talking about impulse. Now, if there is an impulse or force on the wall, okay, um, there is pressure because the force over area, this force because of the gas particles over the wall's area, this gives pressure. Okay, so temperature, volume, pressure, the temperature represented by the kinetic energy, average kinetic energy of particles. The volume of the gas is the same volume of the container. Now, the pressure is due to the collisions between the particles and the walls of the container. Okay, let's move on. Now, we have to talk about laws of gases. We mentioned pressure, volume, and temperature. Now, we will talk about the change on one of them and what is the effect on the other thing. But, of course, if we have three things, you have to make one of them constant to do this. Now, the first law that we have to talk about is the pressure versus temperature. But, of course, we have to keep the volume constant and of course always the mass must be constant 
we don't add gas particles. We don't take gas particles. I have a fixed mass. I have a container that contains uh, gas, and I, I am doing some experiment on this. So to make the uh, pressure, the volume constant, okay, if this is the container, now I have a sealed container here. Means what? Sealed container means there's nothing go in or out from the container. So fixed volume, fixed mass. Now what happens if I heat up this uh, container? So I'm heating the gas particles. Now to see this, okay, and do this experiment virtually, I will go to this website, okay, and try to uh, use it, of course. Okay, let's use this software. Now, this is the container, and I will uh, apply some, I'll put some gas particles inside it. But the first thing that we have to talk about is the pressure versus temperature at constant volume. So I will keep the volume constant, which means I cannot change the space here. Without this, I can change it. Look, I can change the size of the container, which I don't want to do, okay? Now I want to fix the volume and do my experiment. Now applying some gas particles inside this container means what? Now the particles will spread through the whole space, which means, and of course moving randomly, this means that they will hit the walls of the container which means they will change their momentum, which means they will exert some force over the area of the wall. And so this is a pressure. And so instead of having zero pressure, it's now 14.4 atm. What is atm? It's, this is a different story. But the pressure is 14.4. Now, this is at what temperature? It is at 300 Kelvin. Do the math. It's the same of 27 Celsius. Okay, now what happens if I heat up this? Now, by heating the container, you can see that the temperature increases and so the pressure, okay? So why the temperature increased? Of course, I'm heating the gas particles, which means that I'm giving energy to the particles, which means that they will move faster because they gain kinetic energy. So the average kinetic energy now is increased. So the temperature increases. Okay, so why the pressure increased? The thing is, what? It is simply, after giving the particles extra energy, so now they are faster, they will collide the wall, but because they are faster, they will collide the wall more. Okay, wait a minute. This is incorrect. Without heating, okay, the particles will keep colliding to the walls, and if keep looking to the wall, you will count more and more collisions. But to have a comparison, you have to fix the period of time, which means what? It is easily that because the particles are now faster, they will hit the wall more often. The rate of collisions will be more. The number of collisions per second is more. And instead of hitting the walls one million times per second, now after heating, the particles will hit the walls two million times in, in one second. So, so what? Okay, the number of collisions, the rate, the number of collisions per second or the rate of collisions increased, so what? Now, increasing the rate of collision means that the change in momentum is more. And the change in momentum is more means that the force is more. And this, if the force on the walls is more, this means the pressure is more. So, um, simply, if I heat up this more and more, the temperature increases, the particles, uh, the pressure also will increase because the kinetic energy with the particle will be more. And so the rate of collision with the walls will be more. So the momentum, the change in momentum will be more. And so the force on the walls will be more. So the pressure will be more. Okay. Now, of course, it is exactly 
the opposite thing if I cool down, which means cooling down this means that the temperature drops. Why? Because I'm taking energy from the particles. Taking energy from the particles means that the particles now will uh, move slower and slower, which means that the rate of collisions now on the walls will be less. So the change of momentum will be less. So the force on the walls will be less. So the pressure will be less. Okay. So the thing is what? Um, the relationship between the pressure and temperature simply it is direct. It is direct. Increasing the temperature, increasing the pressure. Of course, you can write it in this way. Pressure is directly related to the temperature. Now, the explanation is, if the temperature increases, the kinetic energy of the particle, of the particles, increase, and so, uh, which uh, increases the rate of collision, rate of collision, you can say rate of collision, you can say number of collisions per second, you can say more frequent, more often, I don't mind, between the particles and the walls, please don't forget this, which increases the force on the walls and so increase the pressure. This is the official explanation for this. Okay? Now, the second thing here, the second law that we have to talk about is pressure versus volume at constant temperature, of course, and, of course, mass. Okay? So, I want now to study the relationship between the pressure and volume. I don't want to increase or decrease the temperature. So now I'm fixing the temperature. Let's do this. Now um, I want to do what? If I put some gas particles, I want to fix the temperature so I cannot heat or cool down this. Okay. Now, again, there, is some, uh, there are some gas particles here, so of course we have pressure. Now, what happens if I reduced the space, the volume of this container? Okay, the thing is what? If I pressed the gas, which means I reduced the volume, look, the pressure increased. So reducing the volume increases the pressure. Why is that? Always return back, <coughs> always return back to the collisions, okay? Which means what? Now, reducing the volume makes the space between the particles and the walls less, which means that the particles will reach the walls in less time which means that the rate of collision will increase. Number of particles per second that will hit the uh, walls will be more, which means an increase in pressure. Okay, look, can I say that the particles now are faster? No, because I did not change the temperature, so the average kinetic energy is the same. Okay, so simply, Reducing the volume reduces, uh, increases the pressure. More number of, uh, of collisions per second because the space is less. The walls, uh, the particles will reach the walls more often and so the pressure increases. Same idea if I increase the volume, look, the pressure drops. Now the space is more and so the particles will reach the walls less often which means the rate of collision is, le is less, and so the force is less, and so the pressure is less. So clearly, the relationship between the pressure and volume is inverse. So, pressure versus volume. Now, if the volume decreases, the space of the particles to move will decrease, which increases the rate of collision between the particles and the walls, which increases the force on the walls and so the pressure. Of course, I can do this pressure inversely related to the volume. Okay. 
This is the inverse relationship. I think you took something like this in math. In any ways, if you take, do some math here, it's not required in the IGCSE. Simply, you can reach this point that the multiplication between the pressure and volume is always constant if, and this is only if, the temperature and mass is constant. They are not, this is not true. So, pressure versus uh, times volume is always constant. Okay, is this true? Is this correct before changing the volume or after changing the volume? It is constant, so it is always constant, which means before and after changing volume, which means the pressure and volume, the multiplication of pressure and volume before changing the volume uh, equals the pressure times volume after doing this, after reducing or changing the volume. Now, because the relationship is inverse, clearly the relation between pressure and volume is this curve. It is an inverse curve. Okay, now, um, this is the first, the second equation in this chapter. We said that uh, Kelvin equals this is plus uh, 273. This is the one equation. This is the second equation. The third equation it will be in the end of this chapter. Uh, we will talk about this uh, later, of course. Now, this is for now. We... Uh, I will see you next time, inshallah.